thank you so much for joining us this afternoon and spending the next hour or so uh, listening about our program. My name is Chris Hanley, and I serve as the director of the Grand Challenge on Climate Change, Human Health, and Equity here at the National Academy of Medicine. And today we're going to talk to you uh, about our program. So before I start, and uh, my colleagues to the left here are going to provide you with a lot more information and detail on this, but do want to start off with, um, with this message that I think is a through line throughout this entire presentation, and that's that the climate crisis is a public health and equity crisis, possibly the largest of our generation. And we here at NAM felt that our response to that had to be it's equal in both size and urgency. So we launched our grand challenge, which is not only the biggest program that we currently have, it's also the largest program that the National Academy of Medicine has ever undertaken. And we currently have five pillars, which each of these presenters will talk about, and I'll introduce them now. First up, we have Gabrielle Lemus from the Maryland Latinos Unidos. Following her, Walt Vernon, who is joining us from Mazzetti and the Sexton Foundation. From there, we'll turn it over to Caitlin Rudley, who is joining us from the University of Colorado School of Medicine. And then virtually, uh, we have with us today, very grateful that he's here, Jonathan Patz, who is joining us from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And then lastly, to talk to you about our communication program, we have Teddy Potter, who is uh, from the University of Minnesota School of Nursing. So that's it. We wanted to keep the introduction nice and short so we have lots of time to learn from each other and to share the work that we're doing and most importantly to hear from you all um, with some nice conversation. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Gabriella, who will talk about the first program today from our Grand Challenge, which is our Climate Community Networks. Um, well, good afternoon. Um, let's see here. I think I, which one do I hit the one on the right? Right. Yep. yep. So I'm the, uh, Dr. Gabriela Lemus. I am the executive director of a very small nonprofit in the state of Maryland uh, called Maryland Latinos Unidos. And we got very involved in the work of health and environmental equity um, what, from the moment we started, even though we are the product basically of the um, COVID pandemic. We were created during the pandemic to build a network of uh, public health, social scientists, uh, community-based individuals, et cetera, local government leaders, because um, we were hearing through the grapevine that there was a huge disproportion of people who, who died from COVID um, in, uh, during the pandemic in Maryland. It was estimated at around 21% in, in some of the doctors I spoke to at some of the hospitals, I won't say which ones, um, but we're only 12% of the population. So obviously there's a disproportionality there that demonstrates a health equity uh, challenge, let us say. Um, as you can see here, um, this, uh, this design, by the way, was we work cross borders. Um, and a lot of our vendors and the people we work with live in other countries. Um, this was designed by a graphic group called Estudio Dual in um, uh, Guatemala. Okay, I'm not being successful. In my nope. Can somebody? Yeah, yeah. that'll be easier for me. I'm, I'm kind of hopeless. So our vision is imagining a world where your zip code does not determine your lifespan. And this is particularly important in that cross section between environmental and, um, and health equity. Next. Um, so we were really eager to join this network. Um, when I read about it just randomly, I got so excited. I was like, this is what we're trying to do. This is what we're trying to do. Um, somebody else really wants to engage like this and bring in communities climate communities uh, together to be a part of the discussion in advance of when uh, you know the decisions are being made um, by people like yourselves who are involved in this science from a science perspective uh, and, and, a, and a healthcare sector perspective. And that is the problem, I think, that this um, network, our network, I'm gonna own it because I'm part of it, um, uh, has tried to, to really consider. And um, we, we believe in that as an organization. This is what we do. This is why we were created in so many ways, not just for uh, health and environment, but for economic empowerment and education and other drivers of health, um, as well as advocacy. 
up learning how to advocate and be leaders in our local communities. Um, what we uh, are trying to do uh, is to really begin to center the expertise of our communities because we're resilient. Some of us may have come from countries of origin where we are climate migrants, but we have learned how to literally navigate uh, some really difficult situations and find ourselves uh, you know, in, in a new place and space, but at the same time surviving and, and starting to do better. Um, or at least that has been our goal. Um, and really uh, looking at that intersection. So, and our approach really has been to engage what uh, I call frontline communities, um, because we're the ones at literally on the edge. Uh, we're the communities that may be largely underserved. Um, oftentimes, like in my county, for example, uh, the Latino community tends to live in the unincorporated areas where there may not be good access to services. You may not have transportation to go to the doctor um, anyway. And then let's say you're working in the outdoor sector, you're in landscaping or construction or even hospitality, and you're being impacted by huge heat indexes, et cetera, toxins, et cetera. So um, we're really looking for community-led solutions that can be replicated and we can share the love. Uh, next. So in terms of our goals, it's really been as a network to partner with one another, but also because of this wonderful institution, we're able to get access to experts, experts like yourselves to help us think through because it's not easy. We're dealing sometimes just with the politics of things, um, getting definitions like in policy defined, literal definitions defined, sorry about redundantly repeating again, um, but um, you know, refining our definitions so that they're inclusive of our communities, especially thinking about things like Justice 40. Um, and um, really looking again to these, we call them here structural drivers, we call them social drivers at home, um, to look at those inequities at the local level and co-develop innovative solutions, because that's what it's about. I think, the, you know, just in principle, the more, diversity you have at the table of every type, regional, scientific, social science, what, what sector you're in in, 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 in your work. Um, we're gonna get at the solution faster if we put all of our collective brains together and start looking and examining at what can be done. And then finding, sometimes it's the simplest things and sometimes it's the most complex detail-oriented things. You'll hear more about that next. Um, and um, yet if we discuss it and we talk about it and we bring it to bear, I think that's when we start finding our solution. So it's very exciting as a concept. Um, I'm, you know, I, I love it. And this takes us to the next slide, um, which is this is who we are. We're a group of 18, you know, nonprofit local organizations and clinics, et cetera, who are really diving deep on how we're going to find solutions to all these issues locally. So suddenly you bring us all together. And what was fascinating for me in the first meeting was how much we shared. Like we just had so many issues in common and themes in common. And it didn't matter what community we came from, if we were from like, I'm sorry for saying it like this, the Cancer Belt of Louisiana or Maryland and and some of these smaller communities and pockets in Maryland or you know Maine all the way down to Florida. Um, there were similar you know, challenges that we faced on multiple levels. And a lot of it has to do also with understanding. And then these partners, strategic partners who've come to the table and said, yes, we wanna be a part of this too. And we wanna be supportive of figuring out what the solutions are and how we can envision sort of a bigger way of approaching it because this is a big problem. It's not just us, right? Um, a long time ago, I don't know, some of, the, some of you are very young, but there was a, a house speaker called Tip O'Neill and he would say, all politics is local. Um, and so on that front, all climate action can also be very local. Next slide, please. So what is the role of our community-based organization? Because for me, it's really simple. It's about community education and engagement. We know who our people are. We have trusted community members and folks like we trained, for example, my organization trains community health workers to go into community, talk to people, learn what they've been do going through, but then also bringing that voice back and finding out where some of those like sticking points are. The other thing is we advocate and try to influence policy, everything from the county level. I literally have meetings with the county council and the county executive in just in my county 
but I work in, in about five of the 24 counties in Maryland, because that's about where 70% of the population is. So, you know, it's 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 day-to-day -day politics. It's really local. But then I'm also interested in talking to members of Congress about what they're trying to do. What kind of resources are they going to try to bring to the state, as well as the Senate, senators, and the actual federal government itself. So there's this kind of advocacy. And then you have to take that information. You have to break it down so that it's understandable to the average bear, right? Because most of us aren't spending all day long. We're, we're at our breakfast table trying to figure out what we're going to eat or you know, what's for dinner or do I need to pick my kids up at school? And then this implementation of local solutions, because again, that same model that we're using with the the, the um, the climate community network, we're also using it locally. It's really been, for me, it's been a great experience because it's allowed me to grow faster. Um, next. So these are the kinds of things that we do through our programming. It's awareness campaigns. We're about to launch Agua is Vida, Water is Life, to talk about clean water in, um, in our county through the Anacostia watershed. Why does that matter? Well, it just so happens that with the heat indexes going crazy, the E. coli in the water has gotten more and more extreme. And so now I need to go and make sure that I'm educating my community about water purification, making sure they have... We have a lot of language access problems, and it's not just the Hispanic community, it's most of the immigrant, the larger immigrant communities in the state, because this becomes an issue. And then it, it's taking all these fancy terms and ideas and just making it simple so that people see how it affects them on a day-to-day -day basis. But it's also, like I said, about the policy and the advocacy, and then implementing local solutions. We work a lot as a network. We've built a small um, environmental justice coalition across the state, we call it MAGIC. Uh, because it's um, it's magic. <laughs> it's the Mid-Atlantic Justice Coalition, uh, Maryland Justice Coalition. Um, we, we were a little over, um, it, we wanted to have the whole region. We were like, let's work on the state first. Um, so having said that, um, it's been really exciting, but then we've also had to deal with a lot of emergency response and preparedness. Um, and so who do we normally expect to get engaged in that? That would be your, your emergency services from the state, sometimes the federal government. Uh, you know, we had that Dundalk bridge crash in Baltimore. Um, all kinds of things came up from that. We, we learned um, all about coal in the air in those areas back there that nobody expected and how people were getting exposed to different things. So one issue starts bringing up other issues. So those are things I think also that the nonprofit sector really has an opportunity as a grassroots, uh, you know, movement. So go ahead, next. And this is sort of what we've done to date. I mean, you know, we, we've had a bi-monthly meetings. We uh, have activated our, uh, and I encourage you to go to the website. Um, since there's only 18 of us, it doesn't take very long to look at all our photo voices. Um, uh, but it's really a cool project because we all very sincerely talked about what was impacting our community and what we saw as the future for our, uh, the individual spaces we're working in. There's a lot of feature stories. And um, you know we're also uh, right now in the process of working our tailored uh, member action plans, which is really great because what it does is it, it it allows me to think strategically about the work I'm doing on the ground locally. So this is a gift from my perspective. It helps me move my work much faster. Um, and the fact that there uh, we're also now looking at tools and resources and pulling them together, um, sharing those learning how to use them. Sometimes we need a little technical assistance on that front. Um, and then identifying our priorities and topics to really um, activate and anchor our collective work um, through regional clusters and um, learning collaboratives. Um, at the April meeting uh, for uh, Earth Day, I got the opportunity to speak about research gaps. And one of the things that I feel very strongly about is that we also, as we do this regional work, it's critical. Um, Honestly, I said Maine to Florida. What I realized was there's very little research being done about my community, the impacts on my youth and their development, environmental impacts, as well as um, aging. You know, um, it's, it's um, you, when you think about who gets hit first by heat indexes, it's, it's youth and, and those populations who are aging, but it's also those who might be working outdoors, who may not have rules of the road about how to take care of themselves. And if the local health department for example, and the emergency services are not having conversations and they're not taking into account that there are populations that are underserved and vulnerable and on those front lines, um, they're the ones that are most likely to be hurt. 
And so I always center our work in our community and um, listening, but also in sharing. Um, and let's see, what was the last point? Um, ah, we have a member of our CCN, our, our um, uh, network, uh, who uh, sit on the board of the, well, no, excuse me, the steering committee. I get boards and steering committees a little confused. On the steering committee of the um, Grand Challenge. And so I think that's really a lot because it's good to have a local voice in these kinds of discussions. And it, I think it fits to the goal from the beginning that that historically that was not happening, which gets me to our last slide. And that's our, um, our next steps. Uh, we're looking at getting our action plans actually actioned, um, pulled together and finalized by the end of the year and start implementing them in the second year. Um, one of the really wonderful things that this organization has also been able to help us with is helping us find funding and resources uh, that we can engage with and, and be applied to these projects. Um, it's very hard to find funding for small groups like ours. Um, so um, this kind of support is really important, especially when you add tech on all that technical assistance. So with that, um, uh, we also uh, lastly have a youth engagement program that is being launched. And I think that that is gonna be one of the most exciting parts of all of this because without the next generation, um, you know, someday I'd like to retire and go fishing. Hopefully there'll be fish left and some clean water, <laughs> um, but also a whole generation who can take over and continue the work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabriella. We're going to go ahead and hold all questions to the end and have a more facilitated Q&A discussion. So hopefully you have lots of questions. Just uh, feel free to write them down and uh, we'll circle back. But from there, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Walt. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Um, let's go to the first slide. I, I wanted to start actually by thanking uh, the National Academies and the staff for convening us here today, right? The, the work that the staff has done has just been amazing. And I, I'm just really, really grateful for the opportunity they've created for us to have this conversation. During lunchtime, I actually had to run back to my hotel and back uh, to take care of something. And I got to experience 99 degree heat and Washington DC humidity. It's a heat index right now of 108. And, you know, as I was sweating my way across, um, you know, seeing the construction workers who are out there and, and realizing I'm going to come in where it's air conditioned and they are not. And, and I think in so many ways that encapsulates a lot of, of what we're here to talk about today. There's 100 million people in the U.S. that are under heat alerts today. Um, Hurricane Barrel, unprecedented, and is creating a wave of uh, climate refugees as we speak, was reported in the New York Times. Um, you know, and, and this is just the start of what we have to look forward to, right, in this climate crisis. I had lunch um, a few weeks ago with a, a doctor. He was an emergency room doctor, and he was talking about, and you guys probably all know this. I hadn't heard this before, but in the health professions, we refer to summer as trauma season because mm -hmm. when the temperature goes up, that's when we start to experience more of that. And let's go to the next slide. In many ways, um, you know, the healthcare sector is really unique in the role that it plays in this climate change space. Healthcare is the first responders always to the events that are happening. They see it first, we see it first. At the same time, healthcare also has got to be resilient to the changing climate, whether it's the fires, it's the power shutdowns in California, it's the freezes in Texas, it's the hurricanes, it's the floods, it's the whatever, the healthcare system has got to be there and got to be able to serve. So the, the needs of this sector are really unique in some ways. At the same time, the health sector is a pretty significant contributor to the problem. That's one of our dirty little secrets, right? Um, when you look at, uh, I, I'm a designer of buildings. When I look at buildings, the healthcare buildings, we have the second highest footprint in terms of energy consumption per square foot of any building type in the world. The only thing that's a little more intense is restaurants here in the US. And you can sort of think about why that might be, right? Our greenhouse gas emissions of our health sector are 
twice per capita that of any other health sector in the world, and we get the outcomes we get. So the health sector, right, we are both needing to manage, live through, be resilient to, and at the same time, we have a lot of opportunity to do better ourselves. And in some ways, I think that is such an opportunity because we in healthcare are the voice for health. And so the opportunity to lead by example is huge. So in about 2020, the uh, National Academy of Medicine commissioned a paper to try to think through how should healthcare address this issue and how can NAM help? Let's go to the next slide. So the National Academy used its convening power to pull together a really powerful public-private partnership of amazing leaders and organizations from around the country to try to deal with this issue. Our co-chairs are Dr. Victor Zhao, President and CEO of the National Academy of Medicine, Admiral Rachel Levine from U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, George Barrett, CEO of Cardinal Health, and our, our newest co-chair is Senator Tom Frist, the former Senate Majority Leader um, and the chair of the Global Board of the Nature Conservancy. So it's an amazing group of leaders and, and they are leading an amazing group of leaders. And so they've pulled together uh, leading healthcare systems, associations, nonprofits, payers, academics, researchers, educators, government officials, even engineers like me. And we are coming together to really try to put together an agenda and create movement in ways that are really, really important to really help the sector do the things that I talked about, strengthen our, our resilience, do it at the same time that we're reducing our footprint and doing it in a way that helps to provide leadership in our world showing how critical this, uh, this decarbonization effort is. We have organized ourselves into four working groups, um, which you see up in the supply chain, a, a supply chain uh, group. And the supply chain is incredibly important in healthcare. Something like 60 or 70% of our footprint is the stuff that we use and throw away. So focusing on that is terribly important. And, and the national academies are doing an amazing job of really bringing people together to try to figure out how do we wrestle this problem to ground finally. Um, we have a healthcare delivery work, work group, which is really focused on how can clinicians change how we practice medicine? How do we start, as Don Burwick would like to say, he, he, he told me one time that when, when he helped create the first expression of healthcare quality, climate wasn't a part of that definition, and today it needs to be. And so how do we, how do we engage clinicians to really tackle this new dimension of healthcare quality? The third uh, working group is really focused on teaching the clinicians, not just today's clinicians, but tomorrow's clinicians as well. How do we help empower this generation of clinicians to be the leaders, to be that voice, and to really take us where we need to go? And then last but not least, we have a work group on policy, finance, and metrics that's trying to focus on how can we find and deploy and make use of levers that will help us to um, accelerate the needed change and to measure that acceleration. We also, uh, the National Academies have invited what, they're, what they were called network organizations. Now we're calling them movement organizations, which is to say, this isn't gonna work if only a few people do some things, right? The only way we're gonna do this is if all of us do it and all of us do it well. And so the National Academies has created a big tent where they've invited all organizations of any sort to become a part of the movement. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Let's go to the next slide. Um, the first two years were marked by a number of accomplishments, um, created numerous resources, tools, products, including publishing a number of papers. We've held a number of convenings uh, to bring people together and really accelerate momentum. We've created a series of webinars all very successful and all really focused on how do we help the sector to move in the direction we need to move. Next slide. One of the things that I, I think is really important about the collaborative, um, the collaborative has done a lot. And, and I hear people, including myself sometimes saying, oh my gosh, we're not doing nearly enough. 
we're not doing it nearly fast enough. And I feel that in my bones every single day, every day that I walk down the street and it's 99 degrees outside, right? And I watch those construction workers. But what, uh, one of the things that I think has been so inspiring about the collaborative is not only what it's accomplished as a collaborative, remember it, we are all just volunteers, right? Trying to do this work on top of everything else we're doing. But the things that this collaborative has catalyzed, everything from the Institute for Healthcare Improvements Climate Program to uh, CMS issuing a categorical waiver allowing renewable energy microgrids for emergency power systems to uh, the Joint Commission's new sustainability certification program. One of the real, I think, accomplishments of the Action Collaborative is to create the conversation that catalyzes that change. And I think it's been remarkable. Next slide. Um, so this spring, Dr. Zhao announced our phase two because you no, know, as good as what we've done has been, none of us is satisfied. And, and clearly so much more has got to be done and it's gotta be done as fast as we possibly can. So we're, we're now really shifting away from sort of our, our previous stance of doing stuff in some ways to a focus on how do we build a movement? How do we take a page from the 100,000 Lives campaign and really create a movement so that this isn't just a few icons doing a few things, but it's all of us doing everything that we need to do. And so the work groups will continue to do what they're doing. Um, in, we're gonna continue to uh, produce more educational content more webinars. We're creating an industry mentorship pilot program, which I think is really interesting to help people along the journey. Um, we're building free learning community so that we can collect all of the possible tools and uh, helps, assists to help people along and become part of this movement and to move. Um, and we'll continue our, our uh, Publications, we're going to con continue to work on the scope three emissions and how do we work on the stuff of healthcare? How do, in such an important, uh, an important part, and really only the National Academy has the power to convene that conversation and make the needed change. So it's great. Uh, let's go to the next slide. I just want to say, mate, let's go to the next slide. Uh, we invite everybody to become part of this movement whether you're a healthcare organization, whether you're an engineer like me, whether you're part of industry, a regulator, a banker, a scientist, right? It is gonna take all of us. So you can get more information here. Um, and if you go to the next slide, and I, I don't know if you all have to take pictures of this. I think they're gonna get all this, right? Um, we have all other resources online. And uh, it, it is, you know, at the end of the day, I think Chris said, and he's right, the climate crisis is a health crisis. This healthcare sector ha has got to prepare for it. And we have to take on the role of being climate healers. The National Academy is making it happen. So please join us. All right, how is everyone doing? We're right in the middle here. I heard heat stress makes you a little tired. We're after lunch. So I'm gonna ask for a little audience participation. How many, raise your hands, it, how many of you think we need innovation in the climate crisis? Raise your hand. Everybody's hand is up, okay. How many of you see yourself as innovators to solving the climate crisis? Raise your hand. Every hand needs to go up. Uh, I, you're not sure, raise your hand. Okay, <laughs> perfect. I don't care if you're an intern, if you're president of the National Academy of Medicine, we need you all, whether you're on the outside, the inside, doesn't matter. We, we need each other. And um, okay, one final question. How many of you wanna end up in the emergency department with heat stroke? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Um, all right, you're paying attention now. So. Uh, I'm an emergency medicine physician by day and night. Uh, I'm here uh, with my behavioral scientist colleagues, with the engineers uh, and clinician colleagues to really talk about the people. That's why we're here. The infrastructure is great, the transportation, uh, but it's about you and me. 
And I care about each and every single one of you in this room and want to do everything I can so that you can live healthy, long lives. And so in order to do that, that means we have to address the climate crisis as the health crisis that it is. But there is so much research and innovation driving our community successes and a lot of things that we should all look forward to. So we're, next slide, we're just gonna share a little bit about the research and innovation program. It is quite new, but really what we're doing is looking at new opportunities to support transdisciplinary ideas and partnerships. We need creative thinkers like each and every single one of you in here to correct some of the global imbalances in climate and health research and strengthen research capacity with emphasis on resource constrained settings, particularly in low and middle income countries, who despite uh, everything contributing the least amount to global carbon emissions, they are already being impacted. And I hear from my colleagues, from uh, community members, civil society, negotiators, government officials, and many of these re regions of the world, how they are already suffering the effects of sea level rise, <laughs> acute floods, mudslides, extreme heat, uh, degraded air quality, wildfires. Um, and so our approach is simple really supporting transformative ideas and solutions focused on people, uh, engaging different researchers and innovators to accelerate translation of science to drive implementation. Not implementation for one day or one month, but for years and predicting uh, not only tomorrow, but for the next five, 10, 50, 100 years, what do people need to not only live, but thrive in the setting of the climate change. Um, next slide, please. Right now we have two specific work streams. Now, the first is a research agenda and the second is the regional hubs. The research agenda I'll talk about in a little bit more depth, but really looking at research gaps. And I'm sure we could go around this room three times and have many opportunities and, and areas for delving into science uh, to support the evidence to drive uh, policies that support health and well-being. All right, next, next slide, please. So for the research agenda, there are five phases, as you can see there. Really started back in, uh, in September with phase one conducting interviews, going on to a formal literature review uh, and a convening back in April. There were more than 600 uh, attendees at the uh, virtual and in-person convening in April, really talking about where should we go? How, how do we prioritize all these different things in the setting of, like Walt said, trauma season? And those of us in the emergency department think about uh, trauma season extending from April through December now because it's so warm. It's not just trauma season anymore. It's almost a whole trauma year. So how do we prioritize all of these different research gaps? Right now we're drafting the research agenda and then looking at dissemination, developing a web portal that is user friendly to funders, to organizations, communities, uh, such as with Gabriela's, uh, as well as university settings, and many scientists, policymakers, and clinicians looking to uh, jump into this space. Next slide. Here you can see uh, there are numerous gaps uh, and many areas to intervene. Uh, I hope that all of you find at least one, if not 10 areas on here that intersect with the work that you're already doing and add just a little bit of a climate lens to it. So uh, as Walt discussed, the health sector innovation needs are great. In the setting of climate change, there's growing demands for patient care. There's an aging population, which is fantastic. I love that people are living longer, but there's 8 billion people on this planet that we need to care for and how do we make space for them and ensure supplies and ensure there, there's a climate informed health workforce. Next slide. Now the second uh, work stream is the regional hubs. Now you can see from this picture that not all areas of the world are created equal. <laughs> now you'll also see that 71% of Earth is actually water uh, and that there's land, but various energy infrastructure developments. There's some coastal areas, there's mountain areas. And so not all things are created equally. 
So how do we think about building capacity and technical assistance across these various regions for the effects that are already being um, felt right here and right now? So in order to do that, we're focusing on low and middle income countries. Next slide, please. And leveraging the numerous member academies. Some of you may be surprised to know that there's 150 plus different member academies uh, globally. So how do we use scientists like yourself, community leaders, in order to build capacity and drive new innovation, scientific inquiry, curiosity into smart policies that are what the local people need. Next slide. We also know that disasters and disaster recovery discriminate. And as you can see from the darkest regions, uh, there are many low and middle income countries that are disproportionately impacted uh, by flooding. That means more drownings, more waterborne infectious diseases in, in my emergency units with my colleagues, displaced people, and I care for people from all over these areas right in my emergency unit in Denver. Um, people think it's far, far away, but in fact, I have to think about it every shift that I go to work. Next slide, please. If we look at Global Climate Risk Index, it's not perfect, but this is a pretty good estimate. And you can see in South and Southeast Asia, there are a lot of risks. As some of you may know, that's where the Hindu Kush Himalayan area is, which is also known as the Earth's Third Pole. So we partnered with Nepal, which is again in this region um, and had a long developed uh, NGO called Partnership for Sustainable Development Nepal uh, that focuses on community led solutions. Next slide, please. In March, we led the first uh, workshop um, in Kathmandu. This is a picture just outside of Kathmandu and Chris was there as well but you can see giant boulders. And what ended up happening just a couple of years ago is there was uh, an, a landslide that went down the river. So all those rocks you see, it was actually melting of the glaciers, caused these flash floods um, in this river area and there are boulders bigger than this half of this room that just crashed down. Um, there's also ignited mudslides, which you can kind of see in the background and who do you think lives along the waterway there? There were many communities that were completely displaced with loss of infrastructure, uh, loss of lives uh, and displacement uh, that is still visible to this day. So again, it's very near and dear to the heart of the people in Nepal. Next slide. They also talk about it a lot which in some of your scenarios, depending on where you live, uh, it might not make the headline of the news being a changing climate raises alarm in Nepal. Uh, this is common knowledge. They talk about floods being climate change. And then they talk about people, the workers. So many of you probably have been served by a Nepali worker. Um, they're a large part of the industry. And I know in my, where I live in my hometown, many uh, different Nepali workers uh, support the, our local infrastructure. And so what ends up happening is they end up going in these extreme heat environments, building a soccer stadium, and then come back. And many of these young workers are having kidney failure and being placed on dialysis or even needing transplantation. We visited the local hospital and you can see that dialysis unit there, which filters the blood and all the toxins out. It's essentially an external organ. This is the reality for people who should never have been succumbed to any sort of organ failure um, and it's common language to them. Next slide. Another entity is dengue, which is an infectious disease. And you can see the prevalence of dengue um, has been rising. Um, it's mosquito borne. So if you think about standing water floods um, and then mosquito breeding and the ecosystem changes, uh, this impacts human health and disease transmission. So they recognize that there's been epidemics and um, that there's been these surges and they're seeing it in more Northern latitudes. So if you think about the mountain areas, if you get a fever now, 
in a colder area uh, where you previously never saw fevers um, from mosquitoes, for example, what do you do with that? As a clinician, do you think about these effects? When do you need to helicopter them out, for example, if we think about transport? Um, is that a possibility? Next uh, slide, please. So at our workshop, uh, it was two days in March again, um, we brought together all of these different individuals and had these really challenging dialogues that focused on community-led solutions. You can see there um, in the upper corner, that's actually the Honorable Prime Minister who came because he felt like it was so important that climate change uh, is being addressed on an international scale. And he felt it was important that Nepal leads. Now, Nepal is situated between India and China, right? So um, what have they got to lose in working together? Uh, so with all these scientists, again, we had these really powerful uh, conversations to say, hey, this is a solution. This is a solution. What do we need in order to get there? Who would this address? Uh, next slide. And it was about the people. So I think that's the key takeaway from this, this session is it's about the people. And Walt talked about seeing the outdoor workers in DC. Well, these are just some pictures I took uh, on our visit to Nepal for the workshop. There's outdoor workers and they are constantly rebuilding in the setting of earthquakes and other infrastructure damages and hazards. There's older adults with immense community and national pride, right? Uh, there's with the umbrella, it's a, a mom with a young baby and you can see her milk there just trying to get a little bit of respite from the sun. Um, and then people who are living with the experience of disabilities. Um, so really being mindful about incorporating their ideas into our solutions will help uh, keep uh, and sustain us uh, for being healthy. Next. And then lastly, I just want to thank the entire team. I'm just uh, a spokesperson as part of this, but really Shania, Emma, Chris, uh, Kimber, Rania, Vishnu, Suman, Suresh, Maureen, and James have been phenomenal. And um, it takes a whole team uh, to make this international effort uh, work. So uh, I will pass it to Teddy. Thanks so much, Caitlin. Actually, Jonathan, as long as you're still with us, uh, we're going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay, great. Um, so let me uh, share my screen. Um, someone else is uh, sharing the screen. You should be able to share now, Jonathan. Okay, now, now that's good. Okay, here we go. All right. So does that look good? Yes? We can see. Okay, great, yeah. okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Sure thing. So uh, I'm on this, uh, this roadmap for transformational action to achieve health and equity at net zero emissions, uh, a small task. Uh, and I, this is something, uh, obviously when we're worried about climate change, uh, it is a health crisis. Um, we need to build resilience, but we also need to take advantage of the fact that the, the world recognizes the emergency and we are moving towards decarbonizing or trying to. So can we add ambition through the health narrative to get to really transformational change? So the goal is to catalyze transformative action towards an equitable, healthy, net zero carbon future. And this, um, this pillar of the grand challenge uh, has a deliverable of a series of papers and a synthesis report uh, that will stem from uh, a series of workshops. And within this, we want to demonstrate how health can be integrated across climate policies relevant to nationally determined commitments uh, as countries are negotiating and trying to meet the Paris Agreement um, to address required 
uh, elements and enablers or levers. Uh, in other words, the how to achieve transformational systems change. So this cuts across technology, governance, social and behavioral change, uh, finance, finance in instruments and others. Um, so we, we know a lot about the, ha the, the what, and that's the next one, which is the cross-sectoral engagement. But a real priority is to focus on you know, dynamics of systems change and how do we, uh, what do we know about how to achieve change? Of course, we do want to leverage across sectors and engage those that are relevant for health and equity. Uh, certainly, energy, transportation, food and agriculture, uh, buildings, built environment, industry, and more. So, clearly, as as we recognize that um, through Walt's presentation, you know the health sector has a huge role, uh, and we need to lead from the front because we are the National Academy of Medicine but um, to recognize that our health really is about a cross-sectoral uh, supporting change where certainly we need to design cities for that are healthier. We need energy that is clean uh, as well as affordable and we need uh, sustainable food systems um, uh, as well. So our health really depends across all sectors, the health and all policies idea. Uh, we will be focusing primarily on uh, high-income countries because that's where the emissions are coming from primarily, uh, but we will also uh, look for case examples in both high-income and low- and middle-income countries uh, where we are seeing um, efforts for solving the problem uh, and that we can really learn from uh, other countries, not just wealthy countries. There, there are lots of solutions to be made uh, and to learn from. And also a reminder that um, we're not in this either or adaptation or, or mitigation. It's really uh, those of us in preventive medicine and public health understand that this is a continuum of prevention. Um, most of the, the uh, activities that this pillar will be focused on, however, really are, would be viewed in the mitigation area, you know, because we're looking at decarbonization and what are the health benefits from those. But there are many uh, uh, that look at uh, health adaptation and resilience that have uh, both benefits to reducing greenhouse gas emissions as well as uh, uh, protecting uh, vulnerable populations. Uh, one clear example is uh, urban heat island reduction, you know, where you reduce urban heat so that when Walt, Walt walks across uh, the street there and, and is experiencing the urban heat island in Washington, um, you can have uh, gr green space and other interventions that also uh, reduce energy uh, uh, consumption. So now, of course, we don't want to start from scratch, uh, and we are leveraging off of uh, other uh, activities that have happened before. So, for example, Project Drawdown, uh, which presents over 90 scalable climate solutions uh, that are across sectors, across regions. We want to look at those in, uh, interventions, see where there are benefits for health and equity. Uh, there's the Pathfinder Initiative, the Wellcome Trust funded project led by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, and they're, they've been looking at uh, interventions uh, that are real interventions uh, and looking at ones that have, uh, you know, that it may be relevant to benefiting health. Um, most recently, the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine uh, launched a report, uh, deep decarbonization across the US. Um, that uh, is looking at the societal benefits. Uh, I see one of our participants, uh, former uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Susan Tierney uh, is on this, I see her in the audience, uh, or at least I see her online. Uh, she participated in, in this, and, and this is a cross-sectoral view of solutions to decarbonize across the US. There was a health chapter in that, that shows the major health benefits, co-benefits 
of these policies. So we want to be leveraging off of work that's been done. Of course, there's uh, lots of efforts from the United Nations, anywhere from the IPCC to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, looking at their long-term low emissions development strategies. The recent, uh, the first ever global stock take, taking stock and where we are with the uh, comparing to the climate, uh, Paris Climate Agreement and um, WHO efforts and other reports uh, looking at systems change. We don't want to <clears throat> neglect the fact that there have been major reports looking at uh, transforming the economy to decarbonize. Just a couple <clears throat> obvious examples to many of us in the room. We can see that uh, fossil fuel dependent energy is unhealthy <clears throat> when you burn fossil fuels that uh, release uh, greenhouse gases that heat up the planet. They're also emitting uh, dangerous, harmful pollution. Uh, a, a recent study in the British Medical Journal found that of the 8 million lives that uh, premature deaths from air pollution, more than 5 million premature deaths can be attributed to fossil fuels. The other big sector, a food, sec food sector, um, this is obvious to many of us that uh, if we were to get to a universal healthy reference diet, uh, which is mostly a plant forward diet, that would uh, save 11 million uh, premature deaths every year. And the third big sector that we know a lot about is the transportation sector. And because of our over-reliance on private motorized vehicles, uh, it's estimated that four million premature deaths occur. So this is a lot of premature deaths. If you just look at these three sectors, if you could decarbonize across those three, three sectors, that would be enormously beneficial to our health. The Pathfinder initiative has broken this down further across, um, you know, looking more across these sectors. And you can see um, primarily that these are going through air pollution benefits, dietary benefits, and physical activity across 290 pathways that affect our health. So lots of benefits as we decarbonize uh, across sectors. Um, just to finalize and let you know where we are today, the, this uh, roadmap activity, we, we began about a year and a half ago. Um, we have, uh, you know, we've, led, uh, we've had scoping, scoping meetings, uh, uh, concept note, initial publication is in process. Um, and the two scoping meetings that occurred early last year uh, were a gathering of experts to look at the theor theoretical models of systems change. Uh, including economics, social, behavioral. Um, and the second workshop was more on the cross-sectoral co-benefits across energy, transportation, uh, food, and agriculture, uh, and where we can see the most uh, health benefit across those. And uh, looking to the future, the plan is to um, officially begin this with a, an initial policy publication that we're working on that uh, raises the, shows the rationale for this roadmap uh, that we'll hope to publish uh, early uh, or at the end of this fall, uh, followed by the three workshops with the, the different foci that I mentioned. Ideally, even though we're focused on high income countries, we want to have these workshops around the world and end with a final uh, synthesis report uh, at the Rockefeller Bellagio Center in Italy. So that's that's the plan. Um, and I'll just mention that the uh, the planning group, this is uh, who we are and so far, uh, of course, with uh, very integrated work with the National Academy of Medicine staff. Um, Co-chairs are Andy Haynes and uh, Judy Roden. Uh, myself and Kathy Wotecki are in the planning committee. We're, our goal is to expand our group to about 15 individuals that would be bring expertise that is re, that are that's relevant to the upcoming workshops, and then from that have um, actual workshops uh, developed and uh, and we will be 
uh, very active in the uh, coming year. So with that, um, I thank you for your attention and I'm honored to uh, represent this, uh, the roadmap group. And uh, thank you for the invitation. And I would be with you if I hadn't uh, messed up my back uh, with an extra hour of paddle boarding two weeks ago. Otherwise I'd be with you, but thanks for letting me zoom in and I will stop sharing my screen now. I think it's uh, Teddy. I think you're up. I am. I'm just waiting for the slides to show up, Jonathan. Okay. Sorry about your back. Thanks. I'm better now. <laughs> well, it is my honor to talk about this um, fifth pillar, and that is communication. Uh, communications. Nothing is get, gets accomplished unless we're able to tell our story and invite other people to participate. And so we're going to be talking about, or I'm going to be talking about communicating about climate change and health. Uh, next slide, please. So in this challenge, we had two um, uh, um, uh, deliverables that we were ch uh, charged to um, do. One was to summarize in plain language um, the impacts of climate change on health, which you did a beautiful job, might I add, um, both for how it impacts individuals and how it impacts systems and the interventions that we need <clears throat> and the benefits to approaching this. And then secondly, we need, needed to be able to converse with health professionals and other health communicators. And I wanted to say that all of this is possible. This whole coming together is possible because we have an amazing group of people. Um, I want to thank my uh, co-chair, um, Dr. Jonay Khaldun, uh, Chris Henley, who has been tremendously helpful, and Megan Snare, who is also um, uh, the program director or helping us pull this together. Next slide, please. So how do we come together with this expertise? We scoured the nation. We went for demographic groups. We went for regional groups. We went for um, uh, people with different le levels of expertise. We kept uh, fine tuning it, fine tuning it until we really felt that we had people who were both science experts and communications experts. Next slide. Um, we started out with some meetings of this large group of science uh, specialists as well as, as communication scientists. And we started talking. We started looking at the literature and saying, well, where's the gaps? Because as you know, the Academy is famous for coming up with beautiful reports and wonderful, wonderful statements that help us move forward. And somebody would say, well, I think there's a gap here. And somebody else in the group would say, wait a second, do you know about this report? And we, it turned out that a lot of us didn't know the right hand didn't know what the left hand was doing. Beautiful things are out there for our use, but we didn't know um, what they were or where to find them. So we um, began to think, well, maybe we need to see if this is a problem. And we brought together focus groups. We brought together a focus group on clinicians, practicing health professionals, people in the public health arena, and people from the community. And we said, what do you need? What are, um, if we're going to be communicating about the health impacts of climate change, what do you need? And none of them said, we need one more report. <laughs> they all said, we're overwhelmed, we're tired, it seems so big, there's so much going on, and we don't know where to start. We had then um, uh, brought together a large public comment opportunity. We said, we think this is what's going on. We need a process or a method for disseminating information to people. And this is what, we, um, what we've, we're proposing, is that we have science vet or um, academy vetted papers, uh, resources available to people on a resource hub that will be able to, that will be easy to navigate. And that's what we're going to be creating. Next slide, please. So this resource hub, um, I, I can't explain it other than um, any better than to use a name that's already out there. It's going to be like a WebMD hub, okay? So y'all have probably used WebMD or Mayo, um, a Mayo system, but it's going to be um, for a hub that you can go to. It's going to be the current and best science talking about the health um, hazards of climate change. It's going to um, offer in, um, uh, action items that individuals can take, that health professionals can take. 
and then how to share this information broadly. The audience is for health providers, but also health communicators and anybody, um, any citizen, any parent, any patient, any secondary audience that wants information on how, um, how they move forward. And um, what the Academy is going to contribute is that these resources we are going to have on the hub will be vetted, that they will be meet the very, very high level of standard of excellence that um, the Academy is known for, and they must be evidence-based. They have to be open access so people can't click on this hub and hit a paywall. They've got to be able to access the information, and they have to be applicable to a wide audience. The sustainability for this, because that might be your first question, is this is a great idea, but who's going to run it? We have commitment from the Grand Challenge that they are going to um, house this uh, site, and it's going to be refreshed every one to two years. Next slide, please. And this is a, just a little link to where it goes. We have a beta, we did a beta testing on it. Um, it is, uh, at least the beta test is up and running. But the way it works is you go to this site, and you get to say, I'm a health professional. I um, am interested in heat. I live in the Midwest. Um, I work with elders. And it will come, it will filter the algorithm for you and then give you a list of resources, your personalized list of resources. You could go in as somebody else. It's not going to say you can't click on a button that doesn't belong to you. You get to go in and find whatever you want, but it helps steer you to these amazing national reports, international reports, infographics, videos, all sorts of resources that are available to you so that you too don't have to say, I never knew that was out there. It'll be out there, it'll be available to all people, it'll be free to use. And so um, we, we uh, think that we'll probably be launching it in um, the early months of 2025. Right now we're beta testing it. So we come up with a model, we say, what do you think of this? We tweak it, come back, back and um, over and over, over again, make sure our model is working. Next slide, please. So the next steps are these iterations and feedback. We will be probably reaching out to many of you saying, um, help us out here, go to the site, see what you think, try, all di try different um, uh, algorithms or different pathways, see if this pathway sits well with you. Are we missing something? Is it usable? Um, and we want your feedback. Next step, slide please. So this is an important point because in the past, historically, um, academies of excellence often decided what do the people need and then they went out and created it and then disseminated it. We're doing that backwards right now. We're flipping the model. We're going to the people and saying, what do you need? What do you want? And how can we work with you to help design this platform? So we invite all of you to participate and join us. But in my final piece of saying in communication, I'm hearing a lot of despair these days. I'm hearing a lot of people saying, this is too big, it's happening too fast, it's too hot, um, the world is moving too quickly. What can happen? First of all, you can eventually um, send them to the, the site so they can pick up information geared towards individuals. How do you keep your family safe? How do you keep your elders that you know safe, your children safe? geared towards individuals. Secondly, the other reason I want you to know, um, there's a really, really good reason to hope, and that is the Academy staff. You bet our benefits, uh, beneficiaries here sitting in this room or online of their amazing work, and you very rarely see their name up in lights. So um, in the next day and a half, I want you to find the staff. They're generally sitting around the perimeter here or standing at the door behind the computer and give them a word of thanks. They do amazing work, extremely brilliant people, and we have a great deal of um, hope because of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sadie. So looking at the time, and I think maybe for the first time in our program's history, our speakers have talked for quite a bit of our session. Uh, so maybe we can have time from one question in the room and I'll do my best to um, monitor online as well. So if you wanna use the raise hand function, but we'd love to hear from you all on your reflections or questions for the panel, whatever it is, uh, feel free to ask it.
Yes, go ahead. Please use the mic. I introduce yourself, please. Carlos Salinas with Healing Bridges. That was beautiful. Thank you all very much. Um, I guess I'm, I'm really reeling in a very positive way um, about all this, um, these resources that are coming down the pike. And uh, just yesterday, uh, someone was asking me about my participation today and said, oh, really? It's open to anyone. And I said, yes. Even a lay person like me can show up and ask a question and get it answered. And they said, how come nobody knows about it? And it, there was an implied criticism, right? And I got to thinking about it. It's like, well, how do we break through that giant um, paywall of paid advertisement? You know, how do we get an ad about these amazing resources onto CNN? I mean, we don't have 50,000 to drop on one minute. Um, and, you know, and someone earlier at lunch was saying, yeah, oh, how do you get through TikTok, even though they have an education TikTok? But unless I strip in the middle, it's not going to go into TikTok, you know? <laughs> the speed is just not going to show up. So how do we, how, what are your thoughts about how we do break through, you know, that this world that we live in? where this amazing meeting's taking place. It's open to the public and there's room for us here. And there's not like a giant uh, line going you know, down the mall of people clamoring to get in. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts because uh, this is just such always such fantastic information. Sure, I'm happy to, to answer that. Um, I mean, we talk about it all the time. It's like how you cut through the noise, right? Um, I think one, what I see. So first of all, we are trying to step into kind of the world that you talked about. I mean, I think now we have a new idea for a TikTok video. Um, if you're <laughs> if you're willing to uh, uh, help us out, um, we've been talking to to folks at Harvard, their communications team. So about that very thing, and uh, I'll quote um, one of one of my favorites, John Balbus. You know, he'll stand up at every meeting and say, "We have to be communicating to people where they are. We have to meet them. We have to whether that be Instagram or, or TikTok." And I think from the academic perspective people can be a little bit hesitant to lean into that because it doesn't have that rigor of a lot of other ways that we tend to communicate so i think it's it's being open-minded and then I'll, I'll push not to push all of it onto you but our greatest ambassadors tend to be the people who come to these and then tell people about it so um, obviously that's a smaller end than blasting something out on tiktok but hopefully if we just you know, use all of these methods at our disposal that uh, we can start to make some progress, but I'm open to, to hearing any feedback uh, you know where to find us. Anyone else have any thoughts? Actually, I have a lot. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, we're constantly, you know, as a grassroots organization, we're constantly trying to break through, especially because we're also deal dealing with lack of um, language access, right? Um, and for us, you know, I spend an inordinate amount of time with Nielsen reports. Um, but why? Because the Nielsen reports record how people receive information. And this is part of it too. Um, we all receive information in different ways. We learned this during the COVID pandemic as we tried to educate people about the pandemic itself and then about how, how to stay safe and then all the other components. And this is something public health does every day. Um, we started very small scale hosting our own little, like we had the first health and environmental equity summit for Latinos in Maryland lab two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Um, and it was like, how do I educate people about this before they've never heard about it, right? And how do you um, like make it logical, like so that it, because it, most people say, well, that doesn't really impact me. Why should I be there, right? Um, and yet it, it does. You just heard this is, what did, what did we call it? Um, not a heat month? Uh, for the hospital systems or trauma season. Okay, in the Spanish language media, Telemundo and Univision call the month of August ozone month because um, they spend so much time talking about ozone impacts um, and we have disproportionate asthma. So this example I just gave is, is one way locally working with local uh, media, but also YouTube. I don't know if you're aware of this, at least for Latinos, 79% of Latinos get their news from YouTube. 
Sorry, I know it's disappointing. Um, but and 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 there's another layer to this. How do we fight misinformation and disinformation? Um, my doctor the other day made me question why am I getting help here? Um, told me that he thought that climate change wasn't real. My doctor, my personal doctor, right. And I'm getting an echocardiogram. Okay, not a good time. Stress levels. <laughs> um, and so we also have to learn how to talk about it. How to talk about it. And, and this hub, I'm so excited. You have this hub, oh my God. Um, as a nonprofit, as a small nonprofit, it's really hard to get information. And, and you want it to be of that highest quality that has been vetted because we get bombarded with so much stuff that's just not true. So there's a lot of layers to it. Some of it is using social media. Some of it is, you know, getting comfortable using it. Um, and, and, and the fact that it, but as long as our information is based in science, I feel, and is based in, in results driven kinds of activities um, and we have the conversation um, and to your point, we act as ambassadors. I think we can go a lot further and it's baby steps. You know, you start like our, our, our when, like I said, our organization's three and a half years, very small, tiny, itty bitty budget. Um, but we started off with like 300 people who knew about us. And now we're up to close to 10,000. Um, so it's, you know, you just have to keep at it. Steady, steady, steady grows, grows the fruit. Um, but, um, there are ways to do it. Now, the harder part is gonna be how to get people excited about it so that they join the crowd, but that's another piece. Carlos, I really appreciated your question. Thank you so much. And I hope all of you will keep your ears out for the announcement that the hub is launched. And then when somebody has a question and says, I don't get this, you say, have you checked out the hub? Every one of us can be doing that, pushing out the hub. And that is the go-to place. And then if you find that you go to the hub and it's missing a piece of a report or something that you feel is really important, be part of bringing that forward of can this go on the hub. It's going to be built by all of us and reach all of us, but we have to be the, the influencers. Thank you. Uh, so we're right at time and I don't see any more uh, thoughts online, but before we close it out, we have one minute left. And, and Teddy, I love the way that you ended your session. So maybe I can turn to the other four panelists, Jonathan, still there, um, and give me 15 seconds each on what gives you hope moving forward. Feel free to jump in as you wish, yeah. Um, I, I think the fact that we're having this meeting and having such an open mind and being willing to do cross-sectoral work at a whole new level um, where it's about, it's community-centered, that gives me great, great hope. I don't know if this is about hope or determination, but I, I, I've heard somebody in this election season who's saying, uh, worry less and do more. And I think that really needs to be our watchword. Uh, for me, it's, uh, it's my patience. I had uh, an 80 something year old gentleman come in uh, for a, a health check and uh, He's like, do, I'll do whatever I want, Doc, for the next couple of hours, but I've got to get home. And I said, why do you have to get home? And he said, I'm getting my solar panels tomorrow morning. Um, and so I think there are so many reasons we should be grateful and happy. And a lot of people are understanding and making the connections. Jonathan? Yeah, I think, um, I think the private sector sees the writing on the wall. And I think that, you know, and that is a low carbon future. And given the tremendous health benefits that would accrue from decarbonization, uh, I think we can, you know, if we add the health narrative onto that, uh, you know, the tremendous opportunity to have a healthy future in a, in a low carbon economy, that's, that's what gives me optimism. And I'll just close with one of my favorite quotes. It's an Ethiopian proverb that when spider webs unite, they can tie up a lion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Great way to end the session. So just uh, immense gratitude for everyone who's joining us today, for our panelists for joining us in such a fantastic, fantastic hour and, and change together. Thank you to the staff who are sitting over on the, in the, against the wall over there. 
uh, please feel free to um, bring us any questions. We didn't get the time for Q&A we wanted, so we'll be around all for the next two days. So find us to the reception. Thanks to Dr. Zhao, who snuck in the back there. Um, and uh, just again, thank you all. Thank you, everyone.